What is crack a lacking, pop a loppin', and even jerk a lurkin'? Tech yes, citizens, because today we have the E5 2699V3, the 18 core, 16 thread. <laughs> 36 threaded beast that you can get for $200. And in yesterday's video, and this is part one, we built a PC around this CPU and the whole build ended up coming out better than I expected. And the value for money, even without tuning this PC, was just really impressive. But in today's video, we're gonna take that really impressive, step it up a notch and make it just <laughs> pop a loppin'. And with the E5 2699V3, there's an exploit that exists. And in fact, this exploit exists on all the V3 Haswell Xeons, where you can essentially get the max single core multiplier, which is usually much higher than the all core turbo boost speeds. And you can apply that max single core multiplier speed to all the rest of the cores. So in the case of the E5 2699V3, our theoretical max speed now becomes 3.6 gigahertz on all 18 cores, 36 threads. But this first step is certainly not an easy process and actually took me over half a day to get around. So let's take a look at what happened and if you guys come into the same problem, what you can do to get around it. Are you tired of seeing this annoying activate Windows message? Then if so, today's video sponsor SCD Keys has you covered. For as little as $14 using the coupon code BFTYC, you can get activated today. Works for Windows 11 Pro 2. Link in the description below. Welcome back to Tech Yes City. And in the past, I've done an easy method on how to get that max turbo boost speed on all cores by basically injecting an EFI driver and changing one setting in your BIOS. And this then allowed you to get the max core boost on all those cores and it was relatively easy. However, the problem with this method was if you reinstalled Windows or something happened to the core settings, it could reset the boost clocks and you'd have to do this whole process again. In today's video, I actually went down a different route where you actually exploit the CPU from the BIOS itself. And so it doesn't matter what you install after that, you're always going to get that max turbo boost whether it's on a Linux install, Windows 10, or even Windows 11, this will work beautifully. Or should I stop there and say it can work beautifully? What we had in today's video was a frustrating process where I initially started out following a guide by another YouTuber called MyCoats, and I'll link his video up here as it's very informative, very straight to the point. And there was a three-step plan that they had, which I only needed to follow two since my ASUS BIOS had the last features in the BIOS itself that I could just change those settings. But basically I went in and got the BIOS and made a backup copy of it. And then I removed the 6F2 microcode with MM tool. After that, I injected the Turbo Boost DXE file with the UEFI tool However, I came into problems where the ASUS BIOS itself has write protection in that ASUS doesn't want anyone installing custom BIOSes outside their signed BIOS. However, there is a way to work around this and that is using a USB flashback feature on some of the ASUS motherboards. I'm lucky that the X99-A has this feature. However, I tried doing this with my BIOS that I made and it just didn't work. The BIOS flashback feature just simply wouldn't accept this modern BIOS. So I then went to trusty forums and dug deep. And I kept on digging and I eventually found this amazing person. This person had essentially figured out how to get around this extra step that Azus had by blocking it. And it had to do with the removal of the microcode via MM tool, where essentially they removed the microcode and then basically patched two BIOSes together, which I paused and I scratched my head and I wondered, some people are just brilliant 
in things that they figure out, especially when it comes to budget and getting the most out of your tech. And so this lovely person on the forum, they offered the BIOS to download and then I downloaded their BIOS and then used the BIOS flashback feature and I was now ready to rumble. This was now working, I was unlocking the system and we were now ready to tune the Xeon. But this process is usually much easier. I'll put some links in the description below. And also with the Haswell V3 Xeons, if you're gonna buy one of these and you wanna unlock the Turbo Boost Multiplier, make sure you do not, and I repeat this, do not get an early engineering sample and you get a either late quality sample or retail sample with stepping two or greater. These are the Xeons that will work with this exploit. Now getting on into the tuning stage, the ASUS X99A BIOS allowed us to do quite a bit. And so for the E52699V3, it has a TDP limit of 145 watts, but it has a boost setting of 165 watts. And so what we have to do is work with that 165 watt limit. And so here's where the fun starts in that on the V3 Haswell Xeons, you'll actually want to undervolt them as far as possible. So essentially, until it becomes unstable, keep dropping the voltage in the BIOS. And so what I found was as I was dropping the voltage, the speeds were going up. And that's because we were hitting with those 18 cores, 36 threads, that 165 watt limit at all times. And so this enabled us in the end to get the voltage down to 0.095 or 95 millivolts under the default setting. And so after finding the 95 millivolt undervolt setting, I then went through and changed various other settings like disabling spread spectrum, as well as upping the voltage limits in the BIOS, even though that didn't really do anything in hindsight. But two other important things that I did do within the BIOS was I did disable the C states, the C3 and C6 states, which are reported to make the system unstable if you leave them on. And then another thing I did was up the base clock and the RAM speeds. Now for the base clock, my computer ended up working with 102.2, or in other words, the whole system got overclocked 2.2%. And so this enabled me in games to reach a maximum all core 18 core speed of 3.46 gigahertz, as well as being in Cinebench R23, I managed to get 3.06 gigahertz on all those threads. And so this enabled us to get a Cinebench R23 score of now 15,500 versus yesterday's score of a little over 13,000. So we did get a sizable boost in that score. But one thing to keep in note is that the AVX2 instruction sets will quickly reach that 165 watt limit on this CPU very quickly. Though when I was tuning the DRAM, I noticed that we couldn't up the speeds at all. Otherwise that pretty much crashed the system. So I was left with tuning the 2133 megahertz with the CL timings as best as I could. And here is where I ended up with that 2.2% overclock from the base clock, but also managed to drop down the CL timings to CL 12, 12, 12, and then 31, and then one command rate. And this did give us a little boost, but this is where I was running the games and testing the games with the whole system tuned. And I found we got some sizable increases in some of the games. CSGO getting an uplift from yesterday's 289 FPS all the way to 352. Then we had yesterday's Apex Legends going from the 190 and the 1% and 0.1% lows were also lifted just like they were lifted in CSGO. Then Dota 2 also scored a boost as well. But it was interesting to note that F1 2020 in DX12 did not really fare any better we only got a slight boost in FPS. And this has to do with the fact that the 1080 Ti was being maxed out in this game, even with yesterday's benchmarks versus today. And that slight boost 
would have come from the slight overclock from the base clock of 2.2%. So the numbers are looking really good. And if you guys want me to compare this CPU to the likes of say the new Ryzen CPUs, as well as say something like a 10900K, then I can make that happen in a separate video. But one thing that you guys were requesting from yesterday's video was the power consumption figures. So here we had in idle, this system was juicing 107 watts. Then when it came to Cinebench R23, it went up to 285 watts from the wall. And all these scores are from the wall. When I compare that to the 25,000 uh, Cinebench R23 score on my main rig here, the 10980XE, this was going up to 580 watts from the wall. So, <laughs> and I do laugh during this video because it's a massive difference in power consumption where it does go to show that the diminishing returns on this system really has hit a brick wall and that now we're just juicing more power for not a whole lot more extra. And this came back with the Adobe Premiere Pro results where we tested the 15 minute use parts hunt render and we came in with slightly better scores than yesterday. And I think that's because the GPU was starting to do most of the brunt when it came to this final render output. So something that I learned with Adobe Premiere Pro is that it's starting to get ever more reliant on your GPU as opposed to your CPU. And I guess this is a good and bad thing since the total render times are being reduced, but GPU prices are still remaining very high, which is why I used the 1080 Ti, but we will talk about the value proposition after the rest of these results, where the idle consumption on the 10980XE system was 138 watts. But I will admit that I do have a lot more RGB running on this system, even though when I was testing the power consumption, I did turn off this little Corsair thing and this top light right here that you see, just to get a more fair comparison. But it goes to show that even the 2014 Haswell stuff is very relevant even by today's standards. But the final test I wanted to do was the Fire Strike Extreme, because that will tell me in general how much my system has improved from yesterday as opposed to today. And here's where we saw a solid increase in the physics scores and then also on the GPU score. Since I was tuning, I did get some better points there too. However, comparing the power consumption scores yet again on the main rig versus the Haswell workstation, I decided to put two different sets of results in today's graph. And the first set is the graphics card being tuned without undervolting in mind. And then the second set is with the graphics card being undervolted. And you can see with the RTX 3080 system, without tuning, this thing was going over 700 watts. And that's just absolutely massive in terms of power consumption for a desktop system. As opposed to the Haswell system, we we're able to drop that to as low as 373 watts. That's both the GPU and the CPU being juiced. So now after completing this system and going through and tuning it, I was just really surprised by how much value you can extract out of these 18 cores. And especially at 200 bucks, this just makes a complete no brainer. And I know some people who are pinging me on Twitter talking about the Ryzen 5 3600. And the whole point there is, is that this is more geared towards the 18 core is more geared towards a workstation setup where you can get inexpensive DDR4 memory and utilize quad channel, whether it's registered ECC or non-registered, I managed to get the 64 gigabyte kit for free because the person who gave it to me just gave it to me because they couldn't be bothered selling it to retail. So if you are in a position where you can get something like a 64 gigabyte kit of DDR4 ECC memory for cheap, and you can come into a good X99 motherboard, especially a good used one, then you can really get so much out of something like the 18 core 2699V3. Though the final thing I managed to get working on this build was the side panel in that yesterday's build, 
When I finished it, I didn't actually manage to get that side panel on due to mounting the 120 mil radiator at the rear, which then blocked me from putting my 20 centimeter side panel fan on. However, I then relocated it after drilling some holes at the top of the build to the top, and I was able to then mount the 20 centimeter fan on the side, which made a slight difference. I was actually surprised that it didn't make as much as a difference as it did in that we went on our GPU and we were testing the temperatures. We went from 71 degrees with the side panel off down to 70 degrees with the side panel on. But at least now the build is complete. And also for those asking about the 120 mil radiator and should I put a 240 mil or even a 360 or something bigger on there, since we are limited to 165 watts, on this 2699 v3 it's pretty much pointless to go with anything bigger a 120 mil rad and especially a decent fan on it will do an absolutely fine job of cooling down 165 watts and with that aside that is the tuned xeon 3.46 gigahertz all causing games and 3.06 gigahertz with avx2 instruction sets hammering through it but one thing to keep in mind, if you want to get these cheap Haswell Xeons, I would definitely utilize the quad channel memory, but also less is more when it comes to CPUs and overclocking in that you've got that 165 watt hard limit and you can reach it by giving the less voltages to the cores, which will then enable them to get higher speeds and burn through the same amount of power but at higher speeds. Anyhow, if you guys have stayed this far and you're enjoying that Tech Yes content, then you know what to do. Hit that like button and also let us know in the comments section below what do you think of this tuned system. I just think the value for money it's presenting is absolutely phenomenal. And this PC in its current state is perfectly geared up towards editing even heavy 4K video editing. And of course, gaming with a 1080 Ti is a no brainer. Now we've got the question of the day which relates to this and this comes from Fernando Martin and they asked Brian, what is the best GPU for the E5 2699V3 for gaming? Now when it comes to gaming, if you're gaming at 4K, you could couple this absolutely fine with even something like an RTX 3080. But when you go down to 1080p, you'd probably wanna just pair it with a 1080 Ti like we've done here today. I think the 1080 Ti still represents decent value for money even in this crazy crypto market because the miners aren't targeting 1080 ti's like they're targeting those new cards but with that 11 gigabytes of vram buffer it does really well in programs like adobe premiere pro but it's still also a very good gaming card at least in its raw performance so the 1080 ti would be my pick to go with the 2699 v3 Hope that answers that question. If you stayed around this far and you're enjoying that tech yes content, you want to see the moment it drops, be sure to hit that sub button, ring that bell, and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace out for now. Bye.